My name's Stacy Seabrook, and I approve Eric Cozy on Making a Murderer to be able to use my songs on his channel. Thank you. There's something going on. Your freedom is in danger. Agents of the state, they've taken children from the manger. All oh, they will sacrifice your kid. Take Brendan Dassey, that's exactly what they did. They needed someone, oh, Jody wouldn't flip. They looked around, saw him quick. Oh, it made so much sense why. Oh, Brendan Dassey, he was Stephen's alibi. There's something going on. Wisconsin, that's not kosher. We better stop. Let's all take a look closer. All oh, they will sacrifice your kid for Brendan Dassey. That's exactly what they did. They visit him once, they visit him twice. They make him feel so safe. Sandwiches, soda, so nice. No cameras rolling. And under no lights Who knows what went on up in Fox Hill Monday night There's something going on and Freedom is in danger Everything about this can't get in stranger and stranger All we know they will sacrifice your kid Oh, Brendan Dassey, that's exactly what they did March 1st, alone in a room with Bert and Ernie No parent present And no attorney Four hours later With a touch of the knee They finally get Brendan to agree There's something going on I said there's something going on Oh They will sacrifice your kids Brendan Dassey, that's exactly what they did. There's something going on. I said freedom is in danger when the agents of the state can take the children from the manger. All oh, they will sacrifice your kid. Take Brendan Dassey, that's exactly what they did. Take Brendan Dassey, oh, that's exactly what they did. Hello, okay, so those of you who saw the live that I did on Sunday, December 16th, you saw that I was talking about a document that was created by Adrian Gonzalez, and well, this video is going to be kind of based on one of the things that Adrian was pointing out in her document, and it's about Michael Osmondson. So I went ahead and went and I gathered together some of the screenshots of some of the, the trial testimony of Bobby Dassey and 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 the you know and not only that but some of you know uh, a fair amount of what dean strang was saying um to judge willis and and about how what kratz had done the way that he was attributing this statement to bobby when it was made by somebody else and said to be on a completely different day um that it was violating discovery and and stuff like that it was quite interesting it's quite interesting I'll, I'll just say that so we're gonna see here all that happening and then we're gonna also see the actual queso report itself uh, where it says what Michael Osmondson said and and then it goes we'll, we'll go back in and we'll look at how at the at trial how that whole argument about the way that Kratz was bringing that in basically ended up and how Judge Willis you know it doesn't go all the way to the end but you basically see where Judge Willis starts to tell them that basically he doesn't he sides with the prosecution essentially you'll start to see, you'll see that here in this video anyway it's interesting stuff um but this is why michael osmondson gets kind of looked at when it comes to bobby and and that sort of stuff because this it's it's you know no coincidence that bobby's testimony was the one testimony that the jurors were asking for they weren't allowed it but uh they were asking for it so that tells you something they were asking for that hmm Anyway, so we'll go into the documents now. So here we go. 
Okay, so this is from the trial testimony of Bobby Dassey. So what we're going to be seeing here is is this is going to be pertaining to the statement about Stephen asking for help uh, burying a body or whatever. So this is where, in court, Ken Kratz is asking Bobby about it. Now, Bobby, on the 3rd of November, that would be a Thursday, I believe, do you recall having a conversation with your Uncle Stephen regarding a body? Uh, to which he says, yes. Question, could you tell us what your Uncle Stephen told you that day? Answer, well, my buddy Mike was over too, and he asked us, it sounded like he was joking, honestly. He asked us if we wanted to help get rid of a body. Your Uncle Stephen asked if, if asked you if, if, if you wanted to help him get rid of a body? Bobby answers yes, or yeah. Question, what was your response? Bobby answers no. And then he asks if Bobby's familiar with the Suzuki Samurai. So the interesting thing here, though, is he clearly said, he clearly right here says that it was Stephen that said it to him and, and Mike. And, and also they're placing this conversation is happening on Thursday, right? The third, basically it was the, it was the evening of the third when Teresa Hallbach's mother reported Teresa missing. So, you know, it's, if it's on that night, so it would have been a little bit weird if, if, if they would have known about this before that happened, if they would have been having this conversation before Teresa Hallbach's mom even reported her missing, that would have been quite strange. But the fact of the matter is that's not the way this went down. And we have a statement from Michael Osmondson himself that proves that this isn't the way it went down. And Dean and Jerry actually go on to prove through a deer tag that this conversation actually happened on the 4th and it was Michael Osmondson. And we're going to show you right now Michael Osmondson's statement in case so, so that you can see that. But let's go down here a little bit. Um... Oh, here it is. Okay. So Dean raises an objection. Okay, so here's where um, the court, all right, Mr. Kratz, that's fine. I can do this as is, okay? The judge says, okay, I understand that. Then the court says, Mr. String, was there something else you wish to take up? Mr. String, there was. There's the matter that I raised, and I noted I wanted it recorded that I had raised the matter, but it could wait for our break to raise it. I wanted to do some checking through the discovery, too, before I did it. My recollection of Bobby's test, Dassey's testimony was that he said that on Thursday, November 3rd, 2005, in the presence of Bobby Dassey and his friend Mike, he didn't identify him further than Mike, that Stephen Avery asked if they wanted to help him get rid of a body or the body. I'm not clear. I didn't write this down better. But at the time, Bobby said that he thought Steve was joking about that. And it was shortly after that testimony that I interjected briefly as I did. We have no written summary of an interview of Bobby Dassey in which that statement is recited. So the immediate concern was disclosure of oral statements of the defendant that the state intends to use at trial. I think under section 97, uh, 971.231B. Uh, we, we do have Calumet County Sheriff's Office report of a contact with Michael Osmondson, where, for counsel's benefit, the courts and the courts is page 259 of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department report. That report, which is not an interview of Bobby Dassey, recites a statement of this Michael Osmondson that he and Bobby were inside the garage when Stephen came over, and he goes on from there. I think probably here the best thing for me to do is what I will do is just read for this the court's benefit now and make this a court exhibit page 259 of the report the first chance I get we will make a copy of it I will read it the relevant paragraph in its entirety 
So instead of uh, that, we'll just go to the document itself. Uh, it's a different thing. Hold on, let me go to a different. Okay, here we are. Contact with Michael Osmondson. All right. Michael indicated the only time he had been at the Avery property between 10:31:05 and 10 and 11:14:05 was on Thursday, 11:10:05. He stated. He and Bobby were inside the Dassey garage when Stephen came over. Michael indicated he was aware Stephen was one of the last people to see the missing girl and jokingly asked Stephen if Stephen had had her, the missing girl, in a closet. At this point, Stephen asked Michael if Michael wanted to help bury the body, and they laughed about this together. Michael stated he had just learned about the missing girl on Tuesday prior to that. He once again indicated he thought Stephen might have been the last one to see the missing girl. So... The, the interesting thing here is, number one, he's saying that this happened on, um, he, he's, he, he's placing this state, this, this whole thing happening on, um, 11, 10, 05. So that means he's talking about the week after Teresa essentially goes missing and everything. So it's, I mean this, and so he's talking about the Tuesday previous to that so so first of all this is putting that's putting so what i'm trying to get at is is that's putting this whole thing uh you know a week in the in the in the into the next week after all this all of this happened originally so how is ken kratz taking this statement which bobby or which michael osmondson is saying happened uh, you know in the second week of this investigation and putting this conversation into the first week of the investigation that See, that's Ken Kratz's sliminess. That's that's what we're seeing there. And I don't know. And there's just questions about Michael Osmondson coming in and asking these questions. And then and then all of this getting twisted. And Bobby allowed it. He allowed Ken Kratz to bend him this way. He allowed it to happen. That's, you know, concerning. So that's what I wanted to point out point out here about Michael Osmondson. I was not concerned about Michael Osmondson being a witness in this case. This is Dean Strang speaking. Why? Because Stephen Avery was arrested on November 9th of 2005, and he has been continuously in custody since then, and was not in the Dassey garage or Yonda garage or anybody else's garage on Thursday, November 10th of 2005. Now, we have a different witness to whom this statement has never been attributed, of which we have no summary identifying him as someone who overheard the statement or identifying a statement as having been Bobby Dassey. As the individual identified or critically identified the statement as having been made on November 3rd as a time when Stephen Avery was not in custody, was at home or in the salvage yard property, and the implication is this may have been before Teresa Halbach is even reported missing. In large part, that implication arises because we didn't have the joke that was made to Stephen Avery as the pro as the precursor of this. So, what I'm left with is this jury having heard testimony from the first blood relative of Mr. Avery to testify here, his nephew and next door neighbor, that amounts to a confession of a crime. And under the circumstances, although technically, because Bobby is listed in the report of contact with Michael Osmondson, technically the discovery statute here may have been complied with. I, I have not looked into the case law under the discovery statutes, but setting that aside, this comes as an unfair surprise. It's materially different than the summary or the statement of which we have been given false notice. There is no way to unwind this from the jurors' minds. It has an enormous unfair prejudicial impact. 
I can think of no remedy short of asking for a mistrial on the introduction of this testimony by the state on the direct examination of Bobby Dassey without having been invited by the defense or the defense otherwise having opened the door or done anything to which you could say this would be an invited response. I move, therefore, for a mistrial on the grounds that I have explained. The court. Mr. Kratz. Well, Judge, after Mr. Strang concedes that the discovery statute was complied with, or I guess in his words, may very well have been complied with, I will leave the legal analysis to the court. A summary of this conversation was provided, and although it appears that this Michael fellow got the Thursday wrong as far as being the third versus the tenth, because Mr. Strang is correct that as of the tenth, Mr. Avery was in custody. The witness did testify consistently that the story was that he believed his, his uncle was joking, that it was said in a joking manner, and if Mr. Strang wishes to inquire as to the context of it, he may do so on cross-examination. That is the cross. That is what cross-examination is for. Oh yeah, Kratz is now condescending Dean Strang. Uh, certainly does not rise to the level of uh, material that requires a mistrial. We would ask that the court not do that. Before I go back to Mr. Strang, did I understand that the state indicated they gave uh, that to the defense? Not only the Michael Osmondson statement, but also information from Mr. Dassey that te to, that, that d Mr. Dassey would testify to uh, as he did today. I thought that it what I heard you start to say, or that is what I thought I heard you. That is what I that is what I heard you start to say, Mr. Kratz. No, he got it from he got it from page two fifty nine with all the other discovery, including Mr. Dassey's. I don't know if the conversation is included in Mr. Dassey's report. But it was in Mr. Osmondson's on page 259. Mr. Strang, this page 259 is, is the only notice I had of any discovery, any conversation of anything at all in any form. Indeed, I had asked for any statements of Bobby Dassey. I see no mention of a Mike or Michael or Michael Osmondson anywhere in the report itself that concerns the Bobby da that that concerns what Bobby Dassey had to say. So there, I will tell you, this caught me completely unaware. Mr. The court, Mr. Kratz, I guess I am not sure. What was the state expecting that Mr. Dassey was going to testify to a different date today, uh, to the 10th rather than the third? Mr. Kratz, I, I don't understand the question, judge. It was the third. The witness testified that this conversation with Mike because because Stephen was not in custody then. This witness testified it was on the 3rd. The court. Right. But it's my understanding from what I have been told, and you folks have the benefit of that here, I have not seen the report. That is, that is the report from Mr. Osmondson that indicated the conversation took place on the 10th. Mr. Kratz. We will probably have to get page 259. I don't have, it, I don't have that in here. Perhaps I can make a better record of that. Perhaps the court can read all of page 259. Mr. Strang. Mr. Buting, I think, can go across the hall to the clerk's office and get copies of, two page, of page 259 for everyone, including the court and counsel for the state. All right. We will take our break. Somebody can have the document brought back to my chambers. I will look at it. That's fine. Thank you. After a short recess, the following proceedings took place. The court. You may be seated. Is there any further from either party concerning the defense motion? Mr. Strang, I have one thing to add, Your Honor. This is because this is serious, and I want I want to get it right. I did not say this until double check I until I double checked on the break. But the further the further reason that I was not that I was not concerned and set aside the possibility of the Osmondson statement was the oral statement of the defendant through Osmondson coming in is that the state does not list Michael Osmondson on their witness witness list. Neither did the defense. His name nowhere appears on either party's witness list. And what we have here then on reviewing this is materially is a materially different statement made at an entirely different time and impossible to have been made on the day that Mr. Osmondson says it was made that day. So it's not entirely consistent in the sense that he expresses no uncertainty about having been about it having been November 10th, Thursday, and says that 
and says that is because he had learned of Teresa Halbach being missing on the preceding Tuesday, which only could have meant, which, which could only mean not earlier than Tuesday, November 8th, as the court notices on record. I can stand. So what he's getting at is he's saying that Michael Osmondson is basically saying that he had no awareness of Teresa Halbach at all until November 8th, which would be a Tuesday before the 10th. So therefore, it would be pretty difficult for him to be having this conversation on the 3rd, as Kratz is now asserting it happened through the testimony of Bobby Dassey. This is, when you hear Robert Milan talk about um, trying to bring evidence in through Bobby Dassey that, that the defense never heard about, or whatever, this is what he's talking about. Because Kratz used this. He used a statement that was made by somebody else and tried to, and was trying to bring it in through Bobby Dassey. And 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 that's you know, you know the big deal here. So it goes on a little. The court, Mr. Kratz. Uh, thank you, Judge. First of all, the court needs to note he, that, that there was no violation, at least a statutory discovery violation. The fact that Mr. String indicates the impossibility of November 10th, 05, as being the date of this conversation actually plays in the state's favor and does beg the question why the defense is claiming surprise. They're claiming surprise because you're bringing in somebody's... Oh, jeez. Kratz is something else, man. Born born to be a slimy lawyer. Why didn't they do something uh, with this statement? The defense had this information available to them. <laughs> If, if if the context and the subject matter, oh, blah, blah, blah. Secondly, the, the next is the important note. The jury is not going to be misled at all by this case. A mistrial is reserved. As the court knows, in serious cases of prosecutorial misconduct or breach, uh, or when some other remedy is not going to be available, given the fact that there is no violation, no discovery violation, certainly a mistrial is not... <laughs> yeah, he... That's that's Kratz. He just he just does a little dance. Um I want to just get to the point where eventually But I have also laid out the the practical problems and a good argument could be made and I will make it if there is a case law to support it a good argument can be made that the statement testified to here is so materially different in date time and content uh, than the statement of which we were given notice that they are not the same oral statement but in any event i don't think the court has to resolve that the damages of the problems are clear and are serious the court all right the starting point here is the discovery statute Section 971.231b. The statute requires that the prosecution provide to the defense a written summary of all oral statements of the of the defendant. Uh, that would be statements of Mr. Avery, which the district attorney plans to use in the course of the trial, and the name of witnesses who the defendant made the oral statements to. In this case, the court is satisfied that, at least literally, the statute has been complied with, that the disputed testimony involves a statement attributed to the defendant, and there is no dispute that the discovery information provided by the state to the defense included information indicating that both Mr. Osmondson and Bobby Dassey were present at the time, and the defendant made the statement. Uh, yeah, but kind of interesting that it came in differently, though, didn't, isn't it? Basically, Judge Willis goes on to say that there's no no violation here and and basically and then and then doesn't have to and, and basically you know doesn't doesn't really do anything to correct the fact that Kratz just brought in a statement like that the way he did. And what and what eventually ends up happening is is that the Dean and Jerry postponed uh, questioning Bobby Dassey for the rest of the day this particular day. And then they spend they they spend basically their lunch time and stuff like that, you know, and 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 after court that day, you know, do it going over their testimony with Bobby and all this stuff and whatever. And they end up basically correcting it through the deer tag that this conversation all actually happened on Thursday, or I'm sorry, Friday the fourth, and not you know, uh, or yeah, Friday the fourth, yeah. 
So yeah, that's right. Friday the fourth, and and that that's when this took place, and that's basically after Teresa had been reported missing. Flyers were going up. Uh, it was probably on the news um, in the morning, maybe there in Wisconsin, most likely. So, anyways, there was at that point it was it was known what was going on, and so it's not it's not um, you know it's not information only the killer would have. It's it becomes public knowledge when it when when there's flyers and things like that being spread around and people are looking for. Her. So. But they end up, they Dean and Jerry end up through the deer tag are able to prove that the conversation happened on the fourth and not the third, as Kratz was asserting. So, like I said, Kratz is just a slimy little devil, and Willis was totally willing to allow it to happen, which is why I always say, you know, what you talking about, Willis? But yeah, anyway. So the you know that's kind of why the whole Michael Osmondson situation bothers me. Kratz tries to, to place the, the statements that he makes, but on different days, Osmondson is clear to put his contact in the conversation after Steve gets arrested, which is weird. Uh, I mean, you know, just everything about it. So I just, you know, because of Adrian and her document, and this was one of the things called out on it, I wanted to go ahead and kind of cover it. So that's what we we're looking at there today. I hope you guys liked it and, and enjoyed the uh, information. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe, and we'll see you. Let me tell you about a story. Now we better talk bound about that law enforcement. A right bunch of clowns. How they wear their badge like a plastic crown. How they stick into a story of which they are now bound. It's a rabbit hole they don't want you to go down. But over in Wisconsin, they're doubling down. See, they framed him once, and then they did it again. They did not count on filmmakers making M.A.M. They thought their lives were safe, all went by the ruse. They did not figure on 19 million views. It'll make you shake your head and probably frown. But over in Wisconsin, they're doubling down. I said they'll double down, and they'll triple down. Headed down a road which they cannot turn around They walk around like they'll be home free Cause they control all the evidence on the local judges And found is the state's AG But I got some news It's as plain as day It doesn't matter what the state or the guilty say Cause we got Kathleen She's got them in their sights She's a real live hero turning wrongs to right coming down I said no matter how hard that state's capital pound their house of cards is it coming down it'll make you shake your head and probably frown said over in Wisconsin they're coming down over in Wisconsin they're coming down